Great. Thanks, Kim. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for taking the time today. We know the most valuable commodity we all have is time. It's the limited number of minutes that we all have in the day. So the fact that you took some time to spend with us, hopefully you found that you'll find the topic very interesting. I've heard John speak several times, and I think you guys are going to enjoy his approach um, on how he uh, sees security in the data center. So for those of you who don't know, quickly want to run through a little bit about who C-Store is. Uh, if you do know, uh, you've probably heard this before, but we are a, a leading provider of data center cloud and intelligent technology solutions. Uh, we really focus on the data center, um, and we make sure that you know our focus remains on the things that we can be excellent at and be experts, because at the end of the day, you need people that are going to help you with that. Uh, we've been in business for 14 years. Uh, we are an Arizona-based company. It's where our headquarters is, and but we do have offices throughout the desert southwest and the mountain, although we have clients throughout the United States and have over currently have over 1,000 clients. In fact, we actually do help some clients internationally as well. Uh, as I said, we, you know, we are very focused on the things that we're good at. Our practice areas include what you see on the screen here, data management, data protection, which is how the company was founded, converged and hyper-converged infrastructure, VDI and mobility intelligent video surveillance solutions, cloud and automation, virtualization, and of course security, data center security, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, we do uh, partner with a lot of the key technology partners. While this looks like an eye chart and there's a lot of them up there, I think the key thing is is that you know we choose who we partner with. Uh, we do not partner with everybody. Um, we vet out our partners. We vet out their technologies. We make sure that they are best of breed, um, and so that when we recommend them, you can know that we have tested them in our lab, and uh, we have complete confidence in their ability to provide you the solutions and the business outcomes you're looking for. Uh, we also provide a lot of services for our clients, um, you know, a lot of things around cloud services, whether it's building a cloud, migrating the cloud, managing a cloud, uh, consulting and optimization. Often people have really good infrastructure, but it's not being optimized or used the way it was intended. We can help people with that. You don't always need to rip and replace. Of course, we have delivery and integration services for the solutions we're selling. Uh, we often uh, find customers for new projects need staff augmentation for a short period of time. And while their people are busy, we can provide that deep expertise for a short period of time to help people uh, when they're implementing new solutions or even sometimes when people have a, a shortage where somebody has left the company. Uh, we help people migrate data from any to any, you know, to other systems, from other systems, to the cloud. Uh, lots of uh, skills and ability around that. Been doing that for a long time. And of course, we have managed services uh, around our solutions to help people provide the service level they need to their end users. So, just a quick little bit about us. Uh, I will jump back here at the end. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. And John, they're all yours. Hey. Thanks so much, Larry. I really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody uh, joining in today because we're going to be talking about something that, that I care passionately about, which is how to protect your networks and design them better. And we do that with a thing we call Zero Trust. So if you haven't heard about Zero Trust, you'll hear about it today. If you have, hopefully you'll learn some new things about it. Uh, Zero Trust was, was a concept that I came up with uh, in 2009. And since then, it's really taken off globally. And it, it's about how to build the next generation architectures to solve the problem of data breaches. When you get down to it, we, got, we have to stop data breaches. And if you have a data center, that's where your data lies. Uh, that's what you don't want to get breached. So that's why we're focusing today on the data center. And this stuff will all extend into the cloud or into the mobile device, wherever you want to go. But it's a great place to start where your data is, right? And so <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you today about, you know, what's been happening last year uh, and, and prior to that. Talk about why Zero Trust is the answer to these problems. And then talk about the new technologies that are igniting the Zero Trust adoption globally. So let's just take a quick look at time and and if we look at last year's data this is our security survey from 2015 uh, we are one of the largest survey organizations in the entire world in fact we've got the second longest running survey in the US behind the US Census Bureau and so we we do a lot of work to try to understand statistically with primary research what's going on in the world and so we asked the question hey, have you been breached in the past 12 months? And the answer was interesting, and you can kind of take a look at that, but some key points here is uh, sensitive data was, was breached uh, 
it, by 30 or 37 percent of firms had a sensitive data breach in the last 12 months. Pretty amazing statistic, right? Over a third of companies, and then uh, a third of those companies had that happen more than once. And we see uh, some people have said that they had it up to 25 times. And so. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty significant number. But what's interesting, you might say, oh, John, look, 59%, uh, the majority of people have had no breaches in the past 12 months. And I would say to anyone who said that, how would you know? Breaches are not discovered by the breach party. So you can't say in this world that we live in today that you haven't been breached. And, and let's go back to 2014 and really the end of 2013 when the target breach happened. Target is a great example of a company that didn't know it got breached until after the breach was over and the FBI came and told them, hey, guys, all your data has you know, gone out the door. You've been in a massive data breach. 70 million customer records are gone. Uh, how come you didn't do anything about it? And they said, well, we didn't know. right? And so 2014, the end of 2013, 2014, with the Target breach started the data security revolution. And the reason it did is because both the CIO and the CEO of Target were fired because of a data breach. This is the first time in history that a CEO was fired where the precipitating event was a data breach. And so everything before Target, I call that BT. We are really in the year 3AT after Target. Target changed the game. Target set the precedent that said, hey, have a data breach, fire the CEO. And we've seen that all around. Now, we had another big breach in 2014, Home Depot, and some people will say, oh, you know, John, you're, you're, you know, that's not true. The Home Depot guy didn't get fired. Well, he was retiring. So they brought in a new guy at the same time. Would he have gotten fired? Who knows? But I do know that the Sony CEO got fired because of the Sony Pictures Entertainment breach. And what's interesting about that breach is it wasn't just customer data. It was also data that damaged the brand of Sony, which is really, really important to business leaders. They care about brand damage. And Sony Pictures Entertainment just really suffered. We learned, for example, that, that, that maybe um, some of those actors and actresses that, that uh, we see walking the red carpet weren't the swell people we've always been led to believe. A lot of damaging things, a lot of relationships were damaged, and of course, this, the head of Sony Pictures Entertainment uh, had to leave uh, the company, and even today, I am. Uh, I, the the reports say that the head of Sony Pictures Entertainment today communicates not with mobile devices over a network, uh, but via a fax machine. They're so paranoid there that that he sends faxes to his family uh, when he needs to communicate to them. Pretty crazy stuff, huh? And then we had 2015, and it got bad as well. Look at Anthem. The Blue Cross Blue Shield breach. That was healthcare data, hugely damaging to the people uh, who who have that, you know, who were customers there. Healthcare data has a whole lot of information that can be used to to hurt somebody. Uh, you know, it could be used uh, maliciously to to let an employer know that somebody has a health situation that may make them a bad risk or they may bring up the rates of, of health care. Maybe you don't want to hire them. Uh, it can be used to to steal your identity because it, there's so much information that doctors have to get from you. So health care information is especially toxic. Then we had OPM, the OPM breach. Uh, that was for anybody who who had gone for a security clearance in the US. So all the spies uh, had their data there, including fingerprints which were stolen. This was the knock list from Mission Impossible 1. Remember in Mission Impossible 1, the, Tom Cruise is trying to steal this knock list, this list of all the spies so that the bad guy spies can kill the good guy spies. And he goes into this room through the ceiling with a on a on a trapeze and, and this computer has no access to anything and he uses this special disk to get the knock list down. Well the knock list was actually just easily available for stealing there through the OPM management website and we saw that the head of OPM uh, had to step down and just this week the CIO of OPM 
uh, discovered it, that that uh, a new job was in the offing. So, uh, and then we see the Polish Airlines LOT had to ground planes because of hacking. And if you think about it, because of the computerization of of planes, they're one of the world's largest mobile devices. It's like a cell phone with wheels and and, uh, and wings. And so the, this airline had passengers, it had pilots, and it had planes, the three things you really need to have an airline with, but it didn't have the computer systems working, so it actually couldn't fly. You know, there was a time, and I can remember it, maybe some of you can too, when tickets were written out by hand and computers weren't necessary to fly in an airplane because, hey, they hadn't really been invented yet. But today, it's completely different. If you want to ground an airline, you ground it with hackers. And then we had Ashley Madison. I don't know how many of you got caught up in the Ashley Madison breach. Devastating breach. Again, the CEO was fired. Uh, very interesting because it impacted real lives of the customer base, not just the lives of, or not just the, the company itself. <laughs> and regardless of what you think about Ashley Madison as a company and what the people were doing there, the 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 the, the response or the the consequences were devastating. There were marriages broken up. There were uh, suicides that happened. I talked just last week with a attorney who has 13 clients who got caught up in this whole thing and each one of them to a person uh, eight men and, and uh, five women have come to him and said hey maybe I should just kill myself to get out from under this who would have ever thought that a computer breach could lead to people's deaths that seems like a movie plot but in fact it's been happening and so we, we we need to think about this in new ways. And, and what's really interesting about uh, the Ashley Madison breach was the impact team, the people who did it, they both posted some information about it as they did it and then did an interview about it. So when they, when they posted the paste bin or the list of all the people, they said, we are the impact team. We have completely hacked them completely. And then they said it was easy for a company who's promises security, it's like you didn't even try. It was easy. And then they did an interview with the magazine Motherboard, the online magazine Motherboard. And uh, uh, they said, what was their security like? Oh, it was bad. No one was watching. No security. This is how breaches happen to people who think they don't get breached. Pretty crazy stuff. And if you think you haven't been breached, hey, the average time to detection statistically is 205 days, right? That is uh, a lot of time. That's two-thirds of a year where you have not noticed that you, you've been breached, that your data has been stolen. And most breaches come from, uh, are, come from information from a third party, not the breach party. So that's how you find out about it. So what are CISOs doing today? Well, they have a response that I call hope. And I hope you're not using hope, but if you are using hope, I hope you would not use hope as your risk mitigation strategy. And it stands for put your head in the sand. Oh, I don't have a problem. Obfuscate reality. It's not really as bad as it seems. Or, or maybe they didn't really get the stuff. And then you pee, point the finger at somebody else at Target. They pointed the finger at an HVAC company whose server was on their network and it got compromised, but we all in the security community said, what the heck was an HVAC server doing on your cardholder data network? That's craziness. And the only way it gets there is if you put it there, Target, so it's your fault anyway. And then E, after you pointed the figure and that didn't work, you start your employment journey. And that happened to at Target, that happened at OPM, that happened at Ashley Madison, that happened at Sony Pictures Entertainment. It happens all the time because you don't think about uh, risk in the proper way. So what's the answer? Well, we have a thing we call zero trust, and we think it's the answer. Because your network that you have now was built in the 20th century. It was designed 
back last century. The only thing you still do in IT the same way that you did in the 20th century is build networks. You don't build applications the same way, do you? Databases aren't anything like what they were in the 20th century, and yet you still build networks that way, and then when they fall down, you rebuild them in the same way, and you wonder, hey, why are we having problems? Well, it's because your, na your network is a mess. Your data center network is a mess. Your LAN is a mess because it's based upon assumptions uh, that, that were in place before there was ever any threats. So we have to come up with new ways of doing it. And it, it isn't solved by just putting more stuff out there. You hear people talking about defense in depth. Well, it's really expense in depth. You're just buying more stuff that remains ineffective. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to rethink everything. And if you've heard this term that's the core of our business, our security business right now, trust but verify, you need to get rid of that idea because it is this idea of trust that causes the problem. And so what we have determined is by trusting uh, a packet, you end up actually not verifying it. And so we have to get rid of it. And that was the core research that we did that led us towards zero trust. Get rid of the idea of trust but verify. You don't need trust to move packets from point A to point B. There is no trust flag between or in TCP. So you don't need trust and it causes problems. You see, traditionally we thought about our internal network being the trusted network and our external network being the untrusted network, but in, a, in an age of Edward Snowden, does that even work? Absolutely, it does not work. So we just need to move to a zero trust network where all packets, interfaces, uh, devices, and networks are untrusted. Now, some people will complain to me. They'll say, John, you're saying people aren't trustworthy. And I'll say, no, I'm not saying that. That's a discussion you should have with Julius Caesar. What I'm saying is that people aren't packets, and that's much more profound. No person has ever been on a network. As much as we want to anthropomorphize the idea of networking in IT and talk about John being on the network, I have never been on a network ever in my entire life. Packets asserted to come from my identity have been generated by a device that perhaps I may be using at any particular given time and have run across that network, but they're still just packets. So people aren't packets. And once you understand that, it makes building networks much simpler, much easier, and you can get control of your network. So there are some basic concepts of zero trust. First, all resources are accessed in a secure manner of, regardless of location. It doesn't matter whether you're on the inside or the outside. It doesn't matter whether you're coming from country A or country B. Everything has to be treated exactly the same. Secondly, access control must be done on a need-to-know basis and be strictly enforced. Almost all the breaches happen because access to control isn't properly in place, and we give people access to things they don't need to do their job. Sometimes you hear this called least privilege. Sometimes you hear it called role-based access control. The concept is the same. Figure out what people need to do their job and give them access only to that and nothing more. This will allow us to change our mantra, to verify and never trust. Really important. Never trust. Constantly verify. Are people doing the right things on the network? Are they, are they accessing the right data? Should I have access to payroll data? Probably not. I'm not in HR and I'm not in finance. So if I ever look at payroll data, that's a bad thing. And then we inspect and log all traffic, not just the stuff on the outside, but the stuff on the inside as well. And that's always been thought of as being too hard to do, but we've proven them wrong in other research that follows on from zero trust. And so it's all tied together in a holistic package. And if you do all these things, you can design the network from the inside out, starting at the data, not the outside in, starting at the edge of the perimeter. So you end up putting all your controls as close as possible to the data. That's the best place for them. But when you put the controls on the edge in a traditional hierarchical network, that's the worst place that you could possibly put them. So this is a picture of Zero Trust. This is a picture of the Secret Service protecting the President of the United States. And if we think about the Secret Service, they know some major things. They know who the president is. 
they know where the president is and they know who's supposed to have access to the president. But we don't understand that about our data. So we need to understand what data we have that's toxic, where it's located and who's supposed to have access to it. And that's what Zero Trust does. It provides a data-centric view into it. So Zero Trust is simply a new model of information security where we say, hey, the fundamental problem is this broken trust model where users and traffic inside the network are trusted and privilege is given to allow people to do bad things and those inside the net are external to the network are untrusted. You see, if it would be very dangerous for the president if anybody in a, in a suit and a tie who managed to slip in close to the president was allowed to get there. That's not how it works. They know exactly <coughs> each individual, each packet that is allowed to have access to the president at any given time. And so that's how we need to think about our networks. Now there's lots of new technologies out there coming out every day. And if you're going to be going to RSA next week, you'll be seeing uh, a big fashion show of technologies. And they'll walk down the runway and they'll will say, in this season, you know, it's threat intelligence or it's whatever it's going to be. But you have to go beyond fashion. And we need to look at the real technologies that are that are igniting the, the world of zero trust so that we can build these robust data-centric networks. So there's three big technologies uh, that are disrupting, disrupting uh, the data center world and allowing us to do this. The first one is the development of next generation firewall technologies that serve as segmentation gateways. The second one is the development and adoption of network virtualization. And the third is agile programmability powered by centralized management. So let's look at the next generation firewall technology and why that's so important to Zero Trust. We've always said that Zero Trust starts at the segmentation gateway and, and we talked about the idea of segmentation gateways long before next generation firewalls even existed. But today next generation firewalls have adapted to this idea and they serve as segmentation gateways. In fact, we at Forrester don't call them a next generation firewall because if you talk about the term firewall, people want to put uh, the, the device as on the edge uh, to protect the inside of the network from the evil internet. And that's not where we want it. We want it as close to the data as possible. So hey, John. Ultimately, yeah. John, John, this is Larry. That, I think that's an interesting point because I talked to a lot of chief security officers and, you know, and they, they all agree that, you know, the, the firewalls of the past don't do the job that they need to do today. But many of them still think that if I just build a bigger, better fence or wall or, you know, I just get better firewalls, you know, life will all be good. And I, I see a lot of them struggling with that concept. And I, I think it's probably rooted in their network architecture of the 80s. But I see a lot of them, hear a lot of them thinking that's the answer here. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, even people who buy a lot of these segmentation gate or next generation firewalls and they put them on their perimeter, uh, then use them as a traditional firewall and don't use all the advanced features. So it's silliness, right? What we want to use the segmentation gateway for is completely different. It's a gateway that segments the networks and it has all these features in it, firewalling, intrusion prevention, content filtering, access control, uh, crypt cryptographic solutions like VPNs and um, activity monitoring. All these things, we want them to, to, to exist because in this way we can build security into the DNA of the very network that exists, not make it an afterthought. And that's incredibly huge. So let's look, Larry, uh, at why this is so important in the future network design because here we have a segmentation gateway. Yes, it serves as an internet firewall, but it also does something much more important. It builds what we call MCAPs or microcores and perimeters. So instead of having a great big perimeter, we want to build micro perimeters around particular applications, data types, services, or assets. And so all of these resources within an MCAP, they share similar functionality and therefore global policy attributes. So we can enforce policy at these interfaces. And they're all managed centrally, so we end up having uh, a, a, a unified switching fabric that where, where it's not a backplane about hardware, but about software. So management is the new backplane. 
And I think this is important, Larry. This is why we have to get people to understand this. Because the old model uh, doesn't work. It hasn't been working. We all know it doesn't work. And we, we can see that here is the future. Um, so when, when we look at this idea, we can break the network into as many end caps or segments as we want. And there's no rules about it, but ultimately the idea is to have a scalable segmented network. Zero trust networks are designed to be fully segmented to meet uh, compliance needs, to meet security uh, controls, and they're meant to be scale free. You can build these as big as you want. You can, you know, I have customers who have um, many, many, many segmentation gateways deployed all over the world. Uh, but yet they manage them as a single segmentation gateway. So we make it scale free by doing it this way. And so notice that, that the, the data is very close to the segmentation gateway. If you look down in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, you'll see the cardholder data MCAP. This is where the credit card data would be in target they had done this. And there would have been no way for that cardholder data to do anything beyond just act like cardholder data because there's a micro perimeter around it and we're looking specifically at the activity around the cardholder data. Plus, in a world where we have mobility, this is hugely important, right? And one of the things that, one of the key secret sauces around uh, zero trust is in a world of IoT devices, in a world of mobile devices, BYOD, we don't care what device is on the network, we can enforce this all uh, through the centralized controls of the segmentation gateway and the way the network is segmented. And we see the adoption really rising. Uh, we, we're, we're seeing that right now about 71% of customers have adopted zero, uh, next generation firewall technology. If you're adopting next generation firewall technology, then it's, it's, it's just, it's just a no-brainer to move down the zero trust route. It, it automatically puts you in that category and you will eventually go, go down that route. And so the, the, the next generation firewall, that was the first key technology, Larry. But the development and adoption of network virtualization, that's what's really making it happen because it's been hard to get traffic to the segmentation gateway using traditional networking technologies. But we developed, designed Zero Trust to be network agnostic, and so it works with all kinds of various networks, whether they're fabrics, whether they're SDN. But in all of those kinds of things, we can use virtualization to uh, create the segments and direct traffic to the segmentation gateway more easily than ever before. We can also insert uh, virtual segmentation gateways in various places to provide even smaller micro perimeters uh, than, than ever before using network virtualization. And we can see this when we look at how malware propagates. In your traditional network, uh, you, it's pretty trivial for malware to get on your network because there's no internal visibility to when it has happened until there's a problem. And Malware actually uses the existing switching and routing infrastructure in your organization to propagate. So you hear a lot about malware propagation. Once it's on your network, it doesn't just move laterally. It's not just east-west traffic. It actually goes north-south. It goes northwest-southwest. Uh, it goes all these different directions, and it uses the existing infrastructure. So the idea of lateral movement is really a myth. It's because you only see it after it's traversed to the network, across the network, along the existing routing and switching infrastructure to another endpoint. So it looks like, whoa, that magically just moved uh, eastward. Oh, wow, we're having east-west traffic and lateral movement problems. No, you're not. The traffic is just moving across the network like any other traffic would be. The lateral movement is only happening, um, in your view, it, it's happening, but it's happening because there's no controls where the traffic is moving, and that just is, is just pure silliness. 
So in zero trust, we can stop malware propagation. You know, we have the virtual network infrastructure layer. We have the physical segmentation gateway. We have the virtual segmentation gateway. And now the network behaves completely differently as it relates to malware. So first of all, if I'm trying to bring malware in and drop it through a phishing attack, I have layer seven controls in my segmentation gateway that see that, and we can stop that. That, you know, those, these next generation sam, uh, segmentation gateways, they have sandbox and they have all the controls you need to see what's going on with the malware. And so, bang, we've stopped a lot of it. But let's just say it got onto your network somehow, it got onto an endpoint. Oh no, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have east-west traffic, we're gonna have we're, we're going to have malware propagation. We're going to have lateral movement. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. No, we're not because the workload doesn't move because it gets caught into the micro perimeter, right? Once we have it contained in a micro perimeter, it generally can't go anywhere else unless you write a specific rule and say, hey, allow this malware to go somewhere else. So it's contained within the segment, and that's the value of segmentation, and that's the evil of flat networks. Flat networks, non-segmented networks, or networks that are only segmented with VLANs, any of those things allow that lateral movement. But a segmented zero-trust network doesn't even allow uh, that kind of movement, so it stops malware propagation. And then the third thing that's really uh, spurring on this adoption is the fact that we can have agile programmability powered by centralized management. Now, you know, guys, that uh, uh, we, we talk about agility a lot. And if you've been involved in software development, you've heard about Lean, you've heard about DevOps, you've heard about all these things that are about speed, speed, speed. So we talk about improving agility, and we think at Forrester, uh, through our research, that it's really important to have an integrated portfolio that enables orchestration. Sadly, though, uh, even though we think about adding friction in our networks and our systems to make the adversary's job more difficult. We have a tremendous inter amount of internal friction that makes our job more difficult and we don't have agility and we need to focus on orchestration and agility. You think about it, but do you realize that hackers don't have change management? It's a re revolutionary thought. If you perceive your adversary and how quickly they can move, they're highly agile and you're not. So having centralized management <coughs> of all these systems through orchestration platforms is what's really gonna drive the ability not only to stop attackers, but to meet business needs. When the business says, hey, I wanna do this, you don't have to say that'll be three months or six months or nine months. You can say, you bet, because all of all of my workloads, all of my data structures are designed to have the security travel with them in a zero trust manner. So that's the third thing that's driving zero trust, trust adoption. So ultimately, zero trust is bringing everyone together. It's not just a technological solution. When we designed it, we designed it to be strategically resonant to the business and tactically implementable as a former uh, security architect is somebody who was a network engineer and a security engineer, deployed firewalls, all those kinds of things. I didn't want to create something that was just purely academic and could never be implemented. So we get a lot of calls from people who are representing the board of directors. I talk to CISOs, CIOs, even the occasional CEO about zero trust and why it's important to the business. And that's because the business at the executive level are asking what's the impact of the data breach? and we don't know in many cases. Most organizations can't talk about a data breach. They, they talk about things that really don't matter. If you look at the CISO, the former CISO of Sony Pictures Entertainment, who is no longer there, said, oh, you know, breaches don't cost so much and the controls cost more, so we're just gonna accept the risk. It's a very 20th century view of risk, and it didn't calculate into the fact that that he was gonna lose his job and his boss was gonna lose his job and his boss's 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 boss was gonna lose their job. So the executives now care about security more than they ever have. Secondly, we have 
uh, the, the, the business, the, the marketing and the business intelligence people, they just want to use the data and they're not incentivized to think about the toxicity or the danger of using particular data. In fact, sometimes I make a joke that, that we have two adversaries in security. We have marketers and hackers because marketers just want to use the data and they don't care whether it's a credit card number or personally identifiable information. They'll use it however they need to to get their job done. And sometimes that is not in the best interest of securing the organization. Hackers all know to attack uh, marketing databases and BI databases because they're often less well protected than production databases because we don't realize that hackers can get to any of our data on our network if our network is, is a flat, hierarchical, old school, 20th century network. And so uh, you could make a pretty strong argument that the reason that uh, Target wasn't properly encrypting cardholder data at the point of sale terminal was because they were sending that cardholder data to their loyalty database to do marketing intelligence and they were using credit card numbers to track that. As a former QSA working on PCI compliance issues, I can tell you I saw a tremendous number of companies using credit card information not only as a primary tracking mechanism but as the primary index key of, uh, of a database. And that is illegal within the realm of PCI. Requirement 3.4 says you must render cardholder data unreadable. So we have to help marketing people find new ways to get the intelligence that they need, business people to get the intelligence they need without using data uh, that's toxic in an inappropriate way. And then we have all the IT people, ops and security. And we're all going, what? I, I, I'm here to protect your data? I thought I was protecting networks or devices, right? When I was building networks, uh, years ago, we, we worried a lot about spanning tree and availability and, and, and routing protocols, but we didn't worry at all about the data. We didn't care where the data was going, where it was plugged into the network. That wasn't our job. It wasn't our, our business. And therefore, we didn't know where the data was. And so we need to move towards a more data-centric view of IT ops and IT security. And that's what one of the things that Zero Trust does. Because by looking at this inherent conflict between using data and protecting data, that's a crisis, but like all crises, it's an opportunity as well. And so within that opportunity, that's where we want to focus, and Zero Trust does bring everyone together. So when I do big Zero Trust workshops for my clients, I don't have just security people or even IT people in it. I have marketing people and business people and compliance people. In fact, one network transformation project that is using Zero Trust that is championed by the chief legal officer of one of the world's largest companies because his job is to care about the intellectual property and the patents of the company and Zero Trust solves a lot of his problems. Who would have ever thought that the person driving an IT project was the chief legal officer of a major company? It's happening today. So should you do this? Yeah, it's okay to do this because people are doing it. There's this company called Google. You may have heard of them where the CIO it has built a zero trust network. They call it Beyond Corp. And he's gone out and publicly said enterprises should build zero trust infrastructures. And so it's okay to do this. And there's going to be people telling you, that's not the way we've always done it. Don't do it that way because it's not the way we've always done it. And that's precisely why you should do it, because the way you've always done it isn't working, is it? We're still having massive numbers of data breaches. And so we have to start building new security paradigms into the network. And that's what Zero Trust is starting to do. So let me just summarize. Your current network is a mess. Breaches are rampant. Zero Trust is the solution. Verify and never trust that new technologies are going to make it easier and easier and easier to do it. I have companies who are building zero trust networks around a particular data type in, in less than 60 or 90 days. So it's all about untrusted and untrusted. And ultimately, <coughs> you need to adopt zero trust to help keep your boss employed. 
That's the key thing, right? You're hearing it out there from a lot of pundits, prevention is dead, we can't prevent it anymore. Well, prevent what? That's the question. And the answer is about what you're thinking about preventing, intrusions versus breaches. Intrusions are when something gets into your network, breaches are when something goes out of your network. Breaches are defined by law, and a lot of people are saying, well, what they're really saying is we can't prevent breaches, but they mean intrusions because they get the two terms confused. Breaches are defined by law, by legal precedent, like California State Bill 1386 that says a breach occurs when the unencrypted, personally identifiable information of a citizen of the state of California leaves the control of the entity who has, access, who has that data. So, yes, we can't prevent every intrusion because, well, our networks are too fragmented. They're too mobile, too cloudy. All these things make it somewhat easy for, net, for uh, attackers to get into the network because the attack surface is so big. But is it only the, the, uh, the rainbow unicorn of detection? Protection. Is that where we're going to have to stop? You know, Bruce Schneier, one of the security thought leaders in this industry, talks about passive technologies like that as, as the person who walks by you on the battlefield and says, oh, that's a horrible sucking chest wound. You should have somebody take, take a look at that. Detection is not particularly valuable because it happens post-breach. So remember, when you have people who are focusing on forensics, detection, incident response, that's like the autopsy on a dead body. It, it's not very useful when we, we think about keeping people alive. No one wants to undergo an autopsy because that means you didn't survive. But we want our organizations, our networks, and our bosses to survive. So we better figure out how to both detect breaches, but really we have to figure out how to prevent breaches because otherwise the CEO of Target loses his job, the CEO of your organization loses his job or her job, and maybe you lose your job through the fallout of all that kind of stuff. So you have to do this for much larger reasons than just technological reasons. We have to move in this direction, and Zero Trust will help you uh, keep everybody employed. Okay, that's my time. Uh, we've got time for Q&A. Uh, that's my information. Follow me on Twitter. Love to engage with you in a conversation. Larry, let's take some questions. Okay, sounds good. Kim, do we have any questions? We do, actually. Thank you so much, John. Great information, great insight. At this time, just a reminder, you can still post a question to the questions pane. And we've got a few minutes, so we'll uh, take a few coming in. Um, this obviously is for John. What was the impetus for Zero Trust? I'm, I'm assuming what's behind that, John, is really you know, Forrester historically as a, a research organization. So it sounds like maybe there was uh, some new thinking at Forrester that uh, really spawned this particular solution. Can you talk to that? Yeah. Uh, well, I was tasked in 2008 when I joined with looking at the future of network security. There was a trend called deprimatization that we were looking at. And ultimately, uh, I ended up realizing that this the fundamental problem, as I talked to people all over the world, was this trust model. And when I would say, "Hey, you believe in trust, but verify," well, what are you what are you doing to verify? And they would say, "Well, we're not really verifying because they're trusted." And so that led to the the idea that the trust model was the problem. We wrote a report called No More Chewy Centers, the Zero Trust Model. So we created it as a model, and then people challenged us on that. Well, gee, that's a lovely idea, but it could never happen. And because I'm a former network uh, person and a security architect, I took up that challenge and designed uh, a network architecture that applied the Zero Trust principles in the report, Build Security Onto Your Network's DNA. And then it's just taken off from there. So. I still function as a network designer uh, primarily, and uh, the research that I do helps me build stronger and better networks for my clients. Excellent. It does seem like there's a lot of value in the aggregation of all the data you've received over the years from clients and, and building that. So, excellent. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, you mentioned Google uh, using zero trust. Are there other real-world use cases uh, with results? that uh, you can point to or talk to? 
Sure, there's a lot of them. I mean, a lot of the early adopters of zero trust and the big adopters of zero trust are exactly who you think they might be. Uh, nations, governments, organizations, uh, you know, government and defense contractors, people who won't talk about it. But Google talks about it. Uh, there's a case study up on, my, on the website uh, for people who are Forrester clients where, where uh, WestJet, a Canadian airline, gave a case study on that. And then, then the stuff that's publicly been revealed in interviews and things like that are companies like Netflix and Starbucks who have all adopted Zero Trust. So there's a lot more adoption than what people will say about it because the companies who really gravitate to it are, are pretty closed mouth and we're seeing more and more companies uh, <clears throat> go to that. But I can tell you, I just came back from Hong Kong working on a, a uh, zero trust network to protect smart meters for a utility. Uh, the, there's a shipbuilder in uh, the Netherlands who is doing this. In fact, if you want to really see the epicenter of zero trust, go to the Netherlands where it's it's becoming the dominant network architecture for businesses over there. Uh, so, so it's it's not just here in the U.S. It's not localized. It's a global thing. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we do have uh, one last question. Uh, what are the expected business results? So, I know you talked a little bit about it bringing folks together, um, different areas of the business together. I'm assuming that's behind it. Maybe some uh, of the more obvious direct business results, and maybe there are some indirect results that you've been seeing. Can you talk a little bit to that? Well, first of all, it gives you network visibility and data visibility into what's going on on your network. So that's really, really important. Uh, there's actually a, a, typically a reduction of both capital ex costs and operational costs in Zero Trust as well. I have a client in Papua New Guinea, a bank. Um, they moved from 21 different firewalls amongst three different manufacturers and three different management consoles down to uh, six different devices, uh, three HA pairs of segmentation gateways in, in each of their data centers. So they moved from 21 devices to six devices, three management consoles to one management console. Uh, that's an example of the, of the CapEx and their, therefore operational expenditure cost reduction as well because three consoles is much more difficult to manage than one console. And then uh, I think the, the thing that surprised me the most, the feedback I got from CIOs, is the reduction in audit efforts and expenditures. One company that I talked to, a technology company, the CIO said, hey, I had zero findings on my zero trust network this year. All of the, the auditors came in, they understood exactly what it was for the first time. They could understand the network. It, it made sense. It was logical. And then they said, hey, Either uh, a requirement is already built into Zero Trust, so we'll check that off, or a whole lot of these aren't even applicable for a Zero Trust network, so we'll just put NA, and here you go, you have clean audit findings. <clears throat> for anybody who's ever had to deal with internal and external auditors, that's an amazing thing. So I think that that's probably the unheralded thing that, that I have heard from my customers in the feedback loop of people who have deployed Zero Trust networks. Excellent, thank you. Um, just watching the time in the interest of time, we'll wrap up. That does conclude the questions for today. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. And to John, if you do have follow-up questions, you can see his contact information on the screen there and certainly reach out.